hey, good morning again. Okay, so in our culture, when someone says good morning, you typically respond with a similar response. So good morning. Wow, I'm so proud of you guys. Good job. Good job. Well, hey, as Grant said, we are wrapping up our Patterns of Prayer uh, series, which has been a really helpful series. I feel like it's been really impactful for many people. If you're one of those folks, and this happens to me sometimes with sermon series as well, people are like, oh man, this really changed my life. And I'm like, meh, I don't know that it did. And sometimes that happens. Maybe I missed a few weeks, something took place, I don't know. But I would encourage you to maybe go back through and listen to the sermons again. Uh, there's about six, seven of them. Um, and just let the word of God rush over you and, and let the teaching kind of guide you. Sometimes hearing it all together in a compact sort of setting, maybe over the course of a week or two weeks, uh, can really reinforce some of the things that you picked up, but maybe you've dropped over the past uh, a little while. And so uh, I think one of the things we've done a good job of in this series is talk about how challenging it can be uh, to pray. There's a lot of hurdles. There's a lot of barriers uh, in praying to God. He's the creator of everything, and I am not. And that's intimidating. How do you have a conversation with somebody like that, right? I mean, like you think about people that you, you're like, man, I don't know how to talk to this person. We have nothing in common. Like, how do you have a conversation with God? How do you have an interaction with the Lord when you think about somebody that's just completely different than anything else, anybody else? It's a challenge. It's hard. When, I'm in, uh, when people are in situations that are new to them socially, they react in a whole bunch of different ways. One of the ways is if you're an introvert, you kind of just withdraw into a corner of the room so that nobody can approach you from behind, right? That's like that fight or flight response and you're just making it where you're safe, right? My introverts in the room know exactly what I'm talking about. You're not laughing because you're introverted. It's impressive, your commitment to it. And so you, you just like, I'm going to read the room. I'm going to get an idea of what's going on. And then you have your extroverts who are people like, man, I'm going to talk to everybody. I'm going to get a read of the room by being in the room. I'm going to become the room. The room and I are one, right? Me, I handle new situations, people I'm not familiar with, by making jokes. When I get nervous, I just make jokes, which that probably means I'm very nervous all the time. <laughs> probably true. But when you're interacting with the Lord, like, what do you say to him? How do we talk to God? How do we know what to say? What kind of a posture should be formulated around the words that I speak to the creator of the universe and the redeemer of my soul? How do I talk to him? That's what we're going to talk about today. We're in Matthew 6, verses 7 to 8. And I want us to talk about a posture. A posture to avoid first, a posture to take and then an example at the end kind of to follow here. So let's talk about a verbal posture that we should avoid. So one of the things uh, that people, persons take for granted is sort of this intuitive sense of how to interact with the room, how to engage with people that they don't know, right? And it's not just the words they say, because I can't teach them, I can't teach you how to do that if you don't know how to do that, right? If it was just as simple as telling you the right words, you could say anything and get away with it as long as you had the magic words. It's not about magic words. Like if there are two different people, if me and somebody else are in the room, I can't get away with saying, oh, that's fire. Nope. If I think something's cool, I can't be like, that's fire. I can't pull that off. You, even you are uncomfortable with me saying it <laughs> right now in this moment. You're nervously laughing. Somebody else can do it. I can't. So it's not just about the words. It's also not just about tone, although tone is important. If I walk up to you and I say, hey, you, <laughs> you sound like, I'm I sound like I'm angry. You might not be intimidated, fair enough, but you know I'm angry. But if I walk up and I say the exact same thing, just in a different tone, if I say, hey, you, you're like, oh, wow, like Travis really likes me. So it's not just about tone, although tone's part of it. Posture is the way that you carry your body. Body language is important too in verbal communication. Think about superhero movies, right? At the very end of every superhero movie, there's always this moment, right? Where like the hero finally realizes their power and they're gonna go take on the big bad and all that stuff. And there's this moment. They, she puts her, her shoulders back, chest is out, hair is blowing magnificently in the wind. And she's like, I got this. You're like, yeah, you do. Go, Wonder Woman. 
She's not like hunched over being like, I, I got this. No. So all these things together, somebody can navigate typically and be really effective in interpersonal communication, particularly verbal communication. And all these things put together, I would call something like, and I don't know if I'm the only one that's come up with this, maybe I am, a verbal posture. A verbal posture. A posture is a position or a bearing of the body that's assumed for a special purpose. So you take on a posture when you eat. Many of you were raised, don't put your elbows on the table, chew with your mouth closed. That is a posture for eating. Some of you were raised in a family of many people where you ate like a ravenous wolf in order to get any sort of nutrient. That's your verbal, that's your posture for eating. Let's take a quick survey. Let's talk about posture. How many of you are my people who sleep on their back? Back sleepers, yeah. You are the ones who create music at night as well with your snoring. <laughs> who are my, uh, my belly floppers, my people who sleep on their stomach? There you go. You get up under that pillow. It's just real nice. I can't do that. I get a crick in my neck. Now, who are my people who want to return to the womb? Who are my fetal position side sleepers? There you go. That's me. Snuggle up. It's real nice. You can either side too. You get two options, right? So you get, it's really a, a, a superior sleeping position if I can say so. <laughs> Some of you have a, a, a driving position. Some of y'all like to be like right up on the steering wheel, right? So if the airbag it does deploy, like it doesn't have far to go. Um, Others of you like to like be really, really far back. You're barely touching the pedal, but my goodness, you look so cool <laughs> that it's okay. Those are all different postures for different things, for accomplishing different things. We also have a posture when we pray, right? We just did it. Hey, bow your head and close your eyes. Bow your head, close your eyes. Bow your head, close your eyes. We do that all the time. Some of us fold our hands, right? Especially little kids do this, right? They've got a posture for prayer. But what about a verbal posture? What sort of image, what sort of atmosphere, what sort of environment, what sort of heart condition is it creating when I speak my prayer to the Lord? And this is something that's being discussed in Matthew 6, verses 7 to 8. This is what Jesus says. He says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father in heaven knows what you need before you ask him. So Jesus seems to be very clear about something. Don't pile up words on top of words on top of words when you pray to God. There's two Greek words being used here. I'm not going to repeat them because I tried to pronounce them all this week and I failed miserably. One of the words is, sounds like babble. So don't just babble on and on and on. And the other one just literally means don't use a bunch of words. It means many words. Jesus is saying, when you pray, don't measure the success of your prayer. Don't measure the quality of your prayer. Don't measure your prayer by how much you say, how long you spend in prayer, all that stuff. That is not what gets you heard by God. The amount of words you use to God are not solely the dictator. Just like we said, words, tone, body language. That's not solely the quality of the posture that you take in prayer. He says that, he gives us a qualifier. He says, don't be like the pagans. Now, what is it about the pagans? What were they doing that Jesus is specifically keying in on here? Because here's the thing. Jesus repeats what he prays. Jesus says prayers that are repetitious. Garden of Gethsemane, we're gonna get there at the end of today. But he repeats his words there. Lord, take this cup from me. He goes, he comes back, prays the same thing. Goes, comes back, prays the same thing. Abraham. When he's praying on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah, intervening, saying, God, don't destroy them. Will you destroy them for 50 people? God says, no. Will you destroy them for 40, 30, 20, 10? Keeps going. That's repetitious prayer. So what is it about what the pagans are doing that Jesus is like, mm, no, don't be like that? What are we supposed to avoid? And the posture is this. It's one of manipulation, bribery, and flattery. Avoid that verbal posture. You see, the gods of the ancient world were not gods that were inclined to help mortals. They were capricious, they were cruel, they were self-absorbed, and they used human beings and then discarded them, right? If you know anything about Greek myths, one of the most famous things about Greek myths is Zeus's uh, tendencies to become some sort of other being, an animal or whatever, get a young maiden pregnant, and then abandon her. And then his wife, Hera, the queen of the gods, would harass the, the mother and the child forever. It would turn the, the child into a hero. 
and Zeus would just kind of keep his hands off of it. And these are the kind of gods that they worship. These are the kind of gods that they serve. And this is throughout the ancient world. If you read the, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the gods do not like human beings. They're considered like basically an infestation. They don't like them. And so what the pagans would do is they would pray many lengthy, flattery prayers of, 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 because the, the gods were self-absorbed. They wanted to hear nice things about themselves. They wanted to, 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 you wanted to win over the God to your side. And so you would, you would say, oh, Zeus, rider of lightning, father of many heroes. And you're just flattering him. You're trying to manipulate him. You wanted him to like you. And Jesus tells us to avoid this posture before the God of all creation. We have got to not treat Yahweh like he is some third-rate dispenser of blessing. That is not who he is. You don't have to con God into liking you. Why? He already does. That's what grace is. He really stinking likes you. That's what grace is. And you don't deserve it. God loves you. You don't have to convince him. You don't have to flatter him into liking you. You have to win him over with many words. You don't have to remind God of his offices and his place and his attributes and his qualities. Now, I'm gonna stop real quick. You should do that but not to get him to like you, not to get him to do what you want. You should do that because you love him. You should do that because those qualities remind us of how we should respond in certain situations. Those qualities and those attributes comfort us and encourage us. I mean, we watch the news. I've been glued to the events in Ukraine, more so than other things, I think. It's so extraordinary. And I have to remind myself in prayer that God is in control. He's sovereign. That is, I'm not trying to convince him to be sovereign. I'm not trying to work on my, I have to remind myself. God is not somebody to be manipulated and cajoled and coerced. This is how the pagans try to manipulate and coerce God. They piled up many words. Now, we tend to be a people on the go, tend to be very busy people. Piling up of words is not a thing we do to anybody. We're like, it's called a text message. We've invented them because we don't want to pile up words. Unless you have people that like do the text wall thing and you're like, dude, it's like, call me. Or you know what, better yet, don't call me. No, just stick with the text. That's, that's a good idea. So how do we do it? How do we try to coerce God into working on our behalf? How do we pray like pagans? Here's how we do it. Sometimes we look at the past. We'll be like, God, I gave to the church. I led a Sunday school class for like a billion years. I, I love people. I've been generous. Please take this cancer away from me. We take what we've done in the past and we put it towards the future. Or we look at the future and we try to make a deal with God. We're like, God, if you let me pass this biology test, I promise I will not complain about going to church with mom and dad for a month. It's not that big of a test, so you only get a month. <laughs> or we say, Lord, this is a really busy season. Soccer and basketball and school's finishing up. I promise that if you will just help us to get through this with a little bit of sanity, we will be in church all summer long, except for that month when we're in Colorado. But I promise we'll watch online. And that's how we operate. That's what we do. We bargain, make deals. Sometimes we also repeat the same things over and over again. And I don't mean in the same prayer. So what we do when we do repetition is we repeat them uh, over the course of many prayers, right? So you might mindlessly sort of pray the same things over and over again, like be with my mom, be with my dad. He twisted his ankle, like help him to do well. Be with grandma's cat. She's got rabies and has taken over a whole wing of the house. Like it's just kind of this mindless sort of, I don't know what to pray. So I'm just falling back on like the people I know I should pray for, like be with my, be with my children, be with little Timmy, help him score a goal in soccer because I just can't handle the tears anymore. Or we only pray at certain times. God, you get dinner, you get breakfast, and you get like one other time during the day. And that's what we do. That's how we sort of manipulate God. We're like, I'm in prayer all the time. Are you though? These are all forms of the same verbal posture, which is to, at best to treat God as common. At worst, you're actively trying to manipulate him, to coerce him into blessing your life, right? 
And Jesus says, don't be like this. Don't be like the pagans who are trying to wring blessing out of an unwilling God. Be instead, be different. Be like someone who trusts the king. So let's talk about that. How do we do it? What's the verbal posture that we're supposed to take? Let's talk about this. The verbal posture we're supposed to take. Because what we just talked about is not an act of faith. It's an effort at control. We're trying to control the Lord. But we need to have an attitude of faith. So how do we cultivate this? Well, first, what's the point of verbal communication? Like, why do we need to communicate verbally? I mean, we have a complex society with a complex language. Right? Human beings have complex, we have many different languages. English is of those very complex. We have three words that mean three different things. They all sound the same, but they're all spelled differently. Two, two, two. My daughter's five and learning these things. And she's like, why, daddy? I'm like, I don't know. I'm sorry that our ancestors were cruel, baby. But it's a W there because it's a number. Why is it not 12? I don't know. I don't know. English is dumb. That's why. And we've borrowed from like every language in existence. What's the point of verbal communication? Is it to... Is it to communicate affection? I can tell you that I love you without telling you I love you. I can give you a hug. Now, some of you are like, mm, not a hugger. Don't touch me. I can hand, give you a handshake, I guess. I don't know. Maybe a firm nod. Maybe that. Maybe to communicate needs, I guess. Communicate information. I mean, that's really what it is, right? The lowest common denominator is the exchange of information and ideas. I can tell you how to get to my house from the church. But I can do it better if I can use verbal communication. I can say, take a ride out of here, and then I'm not going to give you the rest of the information because I'm afraid you'll actually drop by. Somewhere off Northwest Highway. Figure it out. So when we pray to the Lord, and R.T. France, who's the commentator I used for, for uh, this sermon today, it's not really about communicating information, which is where it breaks down. The, the verb, idea of verbal communication breaks down as being an exchange of ideas because we're not telling God anything he doesn't know. He's omniscient, right? He knows everything. Now, it could be an exchange of ideas on our part. Like in prayer, God could be imparting to us information that we didn't have. Sure, but that's not an exchange of ideas. That's a one-way street. You are not telling God anything you know, anything he doesn't know. But here's the thing. We often take the right ideas about God's attributes and we apply them wrongly. So like we talk about God's love, we're like, oh, God loves us, and he does. But then you'll walk away and be like, so that probably means I can do whatever I want. No, it doesn't. Or God is a really wrathful God. Yeah, God is a holy God that, that has wrath. That's a part of who he is. Well, that means he just hates everybody, he's angry. No, no, it doesn't. And so we come to God's omniscience, we can be like, well, God already knows everything anyway, so I don't really need to tell him anything, right? And we're wrongly applying that idea because it has to be about something more than an exchange of ideas. It's got to be something more than that. Again, we go back to the idea of a verbal posture, sort of this idea, this posture, this framework that our words are creating around our interaction with God. You're building a platform with your words from which to stand and engage with the Lord. That's what verse 8 is talking about. Verse 8 says this, Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, you might be like Travis. Like you just said, like he knows. And so and Jesus is saying he knows, so we don't have to. No, 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 that's not what's going on here. How does this create a verbal posture? Well, let's use an example. Let's think about two different examples. The first example is you probably have somebody in your life, uh, probably somebody at work, that you tell them one time to do something, and it's done. You don't have to remind them. You don't have to send follow-up emails. You give them a time and a deadline, and they're like, Shing! they're gone. And they're amazing. These people are the building blocks of society. They're incredible. We should build statues in their honor. If you have one of them in your life, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's a friend, they're amazing people. On the other end of the spectrum, if you've ever tried to leave the house with a young child, there is less of that. So on the other end of the spectrum, let's say you're, you're getting ready to leave. And you're like, hey, buddy, we got to go leave. we got to leave in five minutes, so I need you to get your shoes on, okay? 
five minutes to put on shoes. Velcro usually. It's not hard. She come back after a couple minutes. Hey, buddy, remember, we got to leave. And now we've got three minutes. So I need you to put your shoes on. And then you come back again. And there's been progress that's been made. The shoes are out. It's great. But fun fact about shoes, most effective when on the feet. Most people don't realize that, but it is. The shoes are best when actually on the feet. So now you're at the point where you've lost your, your cool and you're frustrated. And so you are bribing, cajoling, uh, coercing, forcing, manipulating those Nike selective hearing 408s right on that child's foot. And you are frustrated and you are angry. And now you are 10 minutes late and everybody's angry at each other. What is the difference between these two stories? It's trust. It's trust. I cannot trust my five and my two-year-old to put on their shoes without a modicum of supervision. I do have some coworkers that I can count on, that I can put forward, put forth effort, and accomplish things without me being on top of them all the time. God is not your coworker. That's much too degrading for God. At the same time, God is definitely not a toddler. The verbal posture that you should take when interacting with the Lord is one of trust. It's an implicit understanding that what God has said he will do, he will do, and you'll trust him in it. God is worthy of your trust. He's worthy of you spending time with him. He's worthy of you giving him your, uh, your deepest, darkest, most troubling things. You can trust him. So with that in mind, our prayer should be simple. It should be direct. Ask God for what you need, what you desire. Learn in the midst of those requests that God really does desire to give you the things that you need. The verbal posture that you should assume is one of humble boldness or bold humility, either way you want to word it. One of bold humility. Now, what do I mean by that? What is bold humility? Let's talk about humility. You are not the creator of the universe. Full stop. Sorry. God is. And so we don't get to go to him and we don't get to tell him what he's supposed to do. At the same time, you are not, as we've talked about, omniscient. And you are not all wise as God is all wise. So even if you were omniscient and even if you were omnipotent, this is something we talked about in Sunday Seminary a couple of weeks ago, shameless plug. We talked about the fact that God's wisdom is the fact that he takes his omniscience and he takes his power and he says, look, I'm gonna do what's best for creation. I'm gonna do what's best for me. I'm gonna do what's best for everybody. You could be both omniscient and omnipotent, but not be wise and you would ruin everything. God is wise. And so when we go to him, we need to humbly recognize, Lord, I don't know what's best for me. I think I do. I think praying that somebody would Cancer would be healed is a good thing. And so definitely pray that way. But we also need to pray with an air of humility of like, but Lord, your plans, your ways are greater than my ways. You do things that I don't understand and I trust you. I'm gonna pray this way until you show me otherwise and I'm trusting you to show me otherwise. But we also need to be direct and bold. Scripture describes God as wanting to pour out blessing. That's not a trickle. That's not reluctance. God desires to pour out blessing on his people. We've got to come before God with our desires, with our, with our hearts, whatever it is, our temptations, and go to before him and say, Lord, this is what I'm going through. This is where I'm at. Please help me. Don't hold them back. God pours out blessing. We pour out need. We pour out desire. We pour out want. So what does this look like? I think one simple thing you could do to adjust your verbal posture when praying is to change demands into requests. So move from, Lord, do this, to, Lord, will you please do this? And check yourself, correct yourself, listen to your prayers. How much are you telling God what to do? And how much are you asking him to do? Shift more to request. That's humble boldness. Now, why do we even have this opportunity? 
We haven't talked about this yet. Why, do, why can't I pray? Why can't I even bother talking to God? I'll tell you why. You are able to go to before the throne of the creator of the universe with bold humility because Jesus Christ, the son of God, went before the powers and the rulers of this earth, sin, death, and evil, and he went with bold humility before them. He boldly stands against evil and death and sin. You see it in Luke 4. He's tempted by Satan and he stands up to him. Whereas Adam in the garden crumbled under the pressure, Jesus does not. Jesus withstands the pressure and Satan flees from him. Jesus is a bold conqueror of sin, death, and evil. But in humility, because him just being a bold conqueror does none of us any good, we're still dead in our sins because we're still punishable because we fold in the face of sin, death, and evil. So Jesus humbly lays down his life before sin, death, and evil. He doesn't get killed. He lays down his life. He's not murdered. He lays down his life. He gives it up. It's a sacrifice. There's a reason why Jesus dies so early on the cross. Remember when he dies, they're all surprised that he died after six hours. You know why he died after six hours? Because Jesus got to choose when he died. He's like, yeah, I'm done. Okay, I'm out. That's his willingness to lay down his life. Nobody else took it from him. And so Jesus takes the humiliation that we were supposed to have for eternity before sin, death, and evil, and instead offers us the opportunity to have bold humility before the creator of the universe because of his humiliation. So where does that leave you? Well, if you've never trusted, if you've never, if you think that your opportunities to engage with God are because of, of some sort of thing that you've done, that's the wrong verbal posture. That's not humble boldness, that's arrogance. And it will not get you hearing before the Lord. But instead, we must look at Christ, to look at Jesus and say, what he did, I want it to count for me. That's the platform I need. And some of us, we, we forget sometimes that that's the standard we have, that that's the, rather the standard, that's the platform we get from the Lord. And so I'd encourage you, if you've never accepted Christ, if you don't know what it's like to go before God with bold humility because of a savior that loves you, you need to talk to somebody today. Maybe you've forgotten, maybe you remembered at one point, but life's gotten out of hand and you wanna to talk to someone. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Before we go, I want us to look at an example. Let's go over to Mark chapter 14, verse 32. I'm gonna read it briefly. And they went to a place called Gethsemane and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know how to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. I referenced this earlier, but I want to look at these three of the things we talked about today in the Garden of Gethsemane because they're examples for us. Jesus is our Savior, but he's also our example. So let's talk about the repetition that Jesus has. Verse four, uh, 39, right? Verse 39, I'm on the wrong page. It says, and again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. Notice how Jesus repeats the exact same thing. He says the exact same thing. Why is this not babbling? Why is this not doing what the pagans do? He says the exact same thing. You find out the answer above. In verse 34, he said, and he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. My soul is very sorrowful even to death. You know why I think Jesus goes back and prays the same thing again and again and again? It's because it's the only thing he can pray. He is consumed with this moment in life. He is, this, this, is, this is overwhelming. His death is at hand. 
Nothing else is important right now. Imagine being in that position. What would you pray for? I'd pray the same things over and over and over again because it's from the heart. And this is the difference. Babbling on like a pagan is only wrong when you're trying to manipulate or coerce God or you're just trying to ramble to make yourself feel good or whatever. But beseeching God from the heart, even if it is the same thing over and over again. There's this prayer, I think the Greek Orthodox Church does it quite a bit. Um, it's, I think it's have mercy, Christ have mercy. It's like that short little phrase. Yeah, that can get repetitious and that can be the most pagan thing in the world if you don't mean it. But if you are under the weight of, a, of an addictive sin, sometimes all you can muster is have mercy, Christ, have mercy. The heart is the difference. Let's talk about his boldness. Verse 36, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Wow. His whole mission is to go and die on the cross. That's what Jesus came to do. And he's like, oh God, just pass, let this pass. Let it be over. Let it end. Now, we know that's not the Father's will. We know that's not what it's about. But he's bold in his request. You can be bold in your request. God loves you. He wants to hear from you. Let's not pray the same simple prayers. And it's fine, it's good. But let's talk about Ukraine. That's the big thing right now. Praying that that would end. What if we just prayed? I mean, why don't we pray a big, bold prayer that like the guns stop working? Why not? The tanks stop moving. The planes stop flying. It just won't work. Is it likely to happen? No. Could it happen? Sure. Let's be people of faith. Pray bold prayers. And your small prayers as well, because God cares about both. Let's talk about humility. Last one. He says, remove this cup from me, but yet not what I will, but what you will. Your will, not mine, is not necessarily a request here. It's a confession. It is Jesus saying, I'm going to take my position, which is subservient to you, Father. I, the Son of God, am laying aside my will so that your will can be done. And so when we pray, we tend to say, oh, not my will, but yours, God, as a request, and that's appropriate. But sometimes we say, I'm gonna go and do what I want, and if you want your will to do, happen, God, you're gonna have to do it. No, 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 no. This is a confession. So the humility that's found in God, I want your will done, even if it hurts me, even if it costs me everything, even if I lose what I have, I want you to be the one in charge. There are three things that we talked about today. We talked about a posture to take, a posture to avoid, and a posture to take. And within that, we talked about repetition, we talked about humility, and we talked about boldness. Speak from the heart, pray from the heart, and do so with humble boldness. And I think it'll change your prayer life. I think it'll shape your prayers with a verbal posture that'll coincide, hopefully, with a good physical one as well. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, Thank you for being a God who receives sinners into your presence by the blood of your Son. There are many people here in this room. Some of them are covered by that blood and some are not. And Lord, I pray that whether they're online or whether in the room, that today would not, the sun would not set on this day before that's settled before questions are asked, before conversations are had. Lord, please, let your spirit work among your people and in the hearts of those who are not yet your people. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you've done for us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.